Hey everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Well, welcome back if you have been a regular viewer. If you're new to my channel, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Jan, also known as Sydney Plant Guy, and I love growing plants indoors, specifically aeroids. On this channel, I have a bunch of very informative contents and tutorials specifically around moss poles. I really like my climbing aeroids, but I also do a series called Plant Spotlight where I really just look at one plant in a little bit more detail. I show you the journey the plant and I have been through together, and then I talk to you about anything that I learned about this plant over the time that we've been together. Now, today I want to put a plant spotlight on my beautiful Alocasia cuprea right in front of me over here. So I got this plant in September 2020. It was a birthday present a couple of years ago. Now, when I got it, it was in a tiny pod and it had like these really small leaves, maybe like that size uh, maximum. After one month of having it, so in October 2020, it gave me my first homegrown leaf and it already started showing uh, a much nicer shape and showing these like distinct uh, like apps or these ribs that uh, the cuprea has. By October 2020 you can see there was another two or three leaves that unfurled in between and it was consistently giving me larger leaves. So I know that wherever I put this those conditions are fine for the plant to continue growing, continue to maturing. So that was all the confirmation that I needed to know that I just need to keep doing what I'm already doing with this plant. By February 2021, you can really see that these leaves have started to growing into started growing into a decent size, and I already repotted it at that stage into a slightly larger 14 centimeter pot. Overall, I feel like alocasias don't mind being root bound a little bit, so. I'm not super stressed about repotting them um, all too frequently. I kind of like to keep them a little bit root bound uh, pretty much at all times. I also pop in a photo over here again from February 2021 where you can just see where this plant was actually living. Right? So around the same time that I got this plant in 2020, I also started setting up my IKEA greenhouse cabinet. And the setup of my cabinet hasn't really changed much over the last two years. And I've got a specific video on just that setup if you're interested. So when I first got that plant, I love popping a new plant into my IKEA greenhouse cabinet because it offers a great amount of light. It offers very consistent high humidity and high temperatures, right? And also because it's an um, insulated little cabinet, right? Like it's very consistent with all of these conditions. Sometimes plants, like plants don't just appreciate like the optimum conditions. They also don't really like too many fluctuations. So they don't like when the temperature suddenly drops really quickly or suddenly rises really quickly and so on. So that cabinet, usually when I get a new plant and I pop it in there, it just gives that new plant as much shelter as possible. So it can establish in my environment, can grow. And then once it starts getting too large, I need to slowly start migrating them out of the, um, the cabinet. And that comes with a different set of challenges, right? But you can see in that photo on February 2021 that I really popped it on, hi Brad, that I popped it at the very bottom of the IKEA cabinet. So despite the fact that I have a pretty strong light in that IKEA cabinet, because it's at the very bottom, it doesn't actually get that much light. And overall, I don't think this plant needs as much light as I initially actually thought it would. By April 2021, um, you can see that these leaves have gotten way too big and the petioles have gotten too long for the cabinet. So I had to move it out of the cabinet and um, I just moved it into a spot with like decent light, but not too much. By August 2021, you can see that the plant is continues, continuing to grow at this stage. Um, it's still in its little 14 centimeter pot, but actually has quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of leaves for that small pot already. By September 2021, you can see that with each leaf, the leaf gets a little bit larger. It starts having more of these beautiful ribs. So, you know, I definitely know that despite the fact that I just took it out of the cabinet, or not just, I took it out of the cabinet, and I was trying to find a spot where it's happy, that whatever spot I found for it, it seemed to be very happy with. And then it just really keep doing its thing. Like in November 21, it pushed out another huge leaf. And then by December 2021, it looked very nice and lush. Th these are actually two plants in here. I've got these two smaller leaves down here. They're their own plant. But all of these larger leaves you can see, they're really all part of just that one plant. Now... To get this plant to actually be nice and lush, you obviously want it to grow, but at the same time, you also want it to not drop its old leaves. Alocasia seem to be 
very keen to drop old leaves as new leaves emerge. But that's usually a sign that it either doesn't have a root system that is large enough to sustain all of the leaves that it currently has, or it could be that it's just not really getting the conditions to, you know, um, help the plant keep all of these leaves um, alive. So it usually drops the oldest leaf. Look, as long as it's the oldest leaf that a plant drops, I wouldn't be too concerned. That's quite natural. It just sacrifices that oldest leaf in favor of the newest leaf. All right, it was still in its small 14 centimeter pot up until March 2022 when I decided to repot it. And I pop in a photo over here. I was actually shocked at how small that root system was if you consider the size and the amount of leaves that it has, right? So that was actually uh, very shocking to me. I was like, holy moly, like where is all of the, where's all the water coming from um, to keep all of these leaves alive? But then these leaves are all quite thick um, and quite rubbery, right? So I, it probably can store a lot of water in the leaves and the petioles in itself. So I feel like it's a fairly common thing that I've seen on the internet that alocasia, specifically the copria, doesn't seem to be having a huge root system. Um, but as long as the root system is healthy, it's going to give you nice large leaves. So I was actually a bit concerned because usually when I repot it, I don't want to disturb the root system too much. But for the sake of that photo and for the sake of really showing you guys how small the root system was, I actually cleaned the roots quite a bit. I was a bit worried that potentially when then potting it up in a larger pot, so now it's in a 20 centimeter pot, that it's not going to like that repot. But I think it just dropped one leaf, which was the oldest one, which was totally to be expected. And then by June 2022, you can see that it's actually starting to grow again, right? So it didn't take long for the plant to get used to its new environment, its new pot. And if I take it out of here as well, you can see that uh, by now, like there's already a lot of roots showing on the side of this pot. But honestly, I reckon it can stay in this pot for a very long time. As I said, it doesn't mind being root bound. It was in that smaller pot for... Uh, over a year, right? So I figured I don't really need to repot this until after the growing season is over. Another thing, I know that people always get really confused because I live in the Southern Hemisphere, so our seasons are the opposite of, of uh, Northern Hemisphere seasons, right? So when it's winter for you guys, it's actually summer over here. So our growing season has just started. So I really repotted it at the end of spring going into winter, which is usually not the smartest idea, but winter is fairly mild over here in Sydney. So I wasn't too concerned, but equally, uh, like even more happy that it actually... Um, was just totally fine with all of this. All right, and yeah, this is what it looks like now. And um, yeah, so let's talk about what I've learned about this plant over the, oh my God, it's almost two years. It is exactly two years, actually. So let's talk about what I learned over the two years of growing this plant. First of all, I want to clarify that I don't think there's different types of cupria. I often get asked what type of cupria it is because the leaves seem to be looking a little bit different to some other leaves. Now, I think I think the first things first, I think it doesn't come across in photos very accurate at all times, right? Let me pop in this photo for you over here. This is the same leaf taken on the same day, just with three different sets of lighting, right? So photos are not a great way to actually show true color of a plant, right? Because especially with your iPhones these days, they just manipulate the colors, um, you know, to make a good photo, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's true to the eye, like it's a true color that you see. The second thing is it, it really depends on the lighting. Is the lighting coming from the back? Is it coming from the front and so on, right? And so throughout all the photos that you saw me pop up on screen, the plant looks completely different at times, right? It has very different colors, very different lighting. It could honestly just be the lighting that I took the photo in, right? And so... Um, no, I don't think this is a different type of plant because it looks a little greener than, uh, than some people are kind of are used to uh, when it comes to cupria. Alrighty. It also has these beautiful, beautiful purple backs. And what I've learned about this plant that it definitely wants to be managed if you want to make it into a nice display. So if I take this leaf away over here, you can see that I kind of tie all of the petioles together using twine. And then I have a little stake in here that I used to, you know, anchor the twine on as well. So I kind of form it into this nice, nice large display over here. 
uh, rather than having the petioles and leaves go in all directions. But I do that with a lot of my plants, but specifically with the cupria, I think it really helps to create a nice display of this plant. Again, I have it in aeroid mix and I love keeping my um, alocasias, or actually I love keeping most of my plants fairly root bound before I actually go ahead and repot them. Now, being root bound in itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but where the concern comes in is that there isn't really enough medium for the plant to actually absorb many nutrients. I'm not worried about that because I actually provide um, liquid nutrients weekly, weekly. So every week or well, with every watering, I suppose, because I don't water this weekly, man, but with every watering, I will provide um, a weak dilution of uh, liquid nutrients. I use GT Australia Foliage Focus. As always, all my plants get the same one um, and it's always linked in the description. But unfortunately, it's not available um, internationally. Like I know that they have expanded into a few different markets, but it's predominantly sold in Australia. So apologies for any of the international um, viewers out there. So yeah, I just mentioned I don't actually water it weekly, specifically now that it's in this larger pot. When it was in a smaller pot and quite root bound, I would water it once a week, approximately, right? Give and take. It doesn't need to be exactly every seven days. Ultimately, look at the medium and see whether it's dry or not before you start watering. Don't just blindly go by a certain frequency. How often to water a plant is really not the right question to ask. It's really when you should be watering a plant. You should be watering this plant, or at least I water this plant before it fully dries out. I do not want that medium to fully dry out, but I also don't want the medium to be soaked at all times. But my medium is pretty light and aerated anyway, so I'm not really concerned about overwatering. Um, but now that the plant is in a much larger pot, I kind of get away with the watering it every 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 two weeks, right? Because a larger pod holds more medium, which means there is more medium to hold moisture. So the, it just doesn't dry out as quickly as a smaller pod. But obviously, once the plant starts growing larger and starts filling up more of the pod, then eventually I might actually have to water a little bit more frequent, uh, a little bit more frequently as well. It is honestly the only alocasia that I had really good success with. Most of my alocasias are definitely not that big, uh, also because not all alocasias can grow this big, right? So a lot of the jewel alocasias, like the dragon scale and so on, I don't think they will ever actually get to the size that this cupria has gotten to. But I haven't really had any comparable success with any of my other alocasias. And I'm not really doing anything too differently with this one. So I don't know if this is just a really easy one to grow or if I did some crazy magic that I'm not even aware of to make this plant thrive. But it was basically just located right here. I just recently rearranged, but it used to be right here. I'll pop in a photo of what the, um, the setup looked like just before. Right now, and after the rearrangement, it actually lives on this table. So it lives exactly where we are right now. And maybe a meter and a half away from me in this direction is a northeast facing window. So it gets beautiful morning sun and then just bright indirect light throughout the day. When it was located over here, it's obviously a little farther away from the window, so it doesn't get quite as much natural light, but it was also right next to the IKEA cabinet. So it was still getting a little bit of supplemental light from the IKEA cabinet. Overall, I don't think it needs a whole lot of light, right? So compared to like Monsteras over here, for example, it's a little bit more removed from the window. So I wouldn't give it quite as much light as a Monstera or any of my climbing aeroids. But that also kind of makes sense, right? It's not a climber, so it's not climbing up the canopy, look in, in search for more light. It kind of just dwells on the floor, right? Like it grows uh, on, on, on the floor. So it wouldn't get as much light as, um, as a plant would get that uh, climbs up a tree. I, I, I don't control the humidity in this room specifically. So it's growing in just natural humidity over here. Um, at the moment, it's it's been really rainy in Sydney over the last week. So we've had humidity of like 70% or so. But, you know, during a dry week, the humidity could easily drop to 30, 40% in this room. And it seems to be fine. So I don't think it needs like a really high humidity environment or not, I don't, I don't think, I know, because it hasn't been growing in a really high humidity environment. I know it doesn't need crazy amount of humidities like uh, most of the anthuriums or like your philodendron vercoisum or so on would, would probably like. And it also makes total sense. The leaves are really thick and rubbery, right? So usually if you have really 
thin leaves, um, then that might require more humidity. Usually your velvets need a little bit more humidity as well. More humidity is probably going to make it thrive more, right? Like all plants, apart from succulents and cacti, usually appreciate humidity. But I suppose humidity is probably the hardest challenge we are facing when growing indoors because, well, we don't want to keep our indoors at 90% humidity. That is not going to be good for you or your apartment. So um, I wouldn't stress too much about humidity with this one. Temperature-wise, alocasias can go dormant if the temperatures drop or if they're not getting enough light. Um, now, mine hasn't gone dormant over the two years that I've had it, but none of my plants really go dormant because... Well, I keep my apartment nice and warm. And honestly, Sydney winter also isn't that super cold. But if you live in a country with a much harsher winter, I wouldn't be too concerned if this plant goes dormant uh, over winter. It will just pop back up um, in spring when it's getting warmer and you get more sunlight. But while it's dormant, it's not really using any energy or water. So just be really, really careful with watering up probably wouldn't even water it at all while it's dormant because well, where's all that water going to go? You're just more likely going to uh, cause root rot if you keep watering while the plant is actually dormant. All right, so I think that really covers everything with this plant. Um, so we've spoken about the environmental conditions that I've given and we've spoken about the care that I give it. So honestly, there is nothing really specific that I do with this plant that I haven't done with any other. So I'm honestly not sure why this plant is growing so much better than any of my other alocasia, but look, I'm not complaining. I'll take it for what it is. One thing or the one thing that I kind of could think of is that I kept this in the Ikea cabinet. I, I, had ne I never put any of my other allocages in my Ikea cabinet and I gave it the best um, way of establishing itself basically, right? Like it grew really strong, really fast at the beginning and I just feel like once any plant reaches like a certain size, it's just going to be much easier and more resilient to continue growing it, right? So... I feel like because it sized up quite quickly and it was given like perfect conditions in that Ikea cabinet that once I took it out, yes, it went through a little bit of stress, but it was already large enough and had enough leaves to actually produce energy to continue growing, right? Whereas I think sometimes that initial stage, growing it from a smaller plant into an established plant, that's probably the challenge. Once a plant is more established, I'm actually having a much easier time looking after it. So I feel like that might be the trick, right? Like establishing it by giving it perfect conditions. And then once it grew too large, it's kind of just doing its own thing. At least that's kind of the story I tell myself because I love to have a bit of a lesson learned out of my plant care routine. Um, yeah. Last thing before we wrap it up, alocasias seem to be flowering a lot for me. And I know that I'm not the only one with that problem. I see it on the internet all the time. So I think the last three or four growth points were all actually just flowers. I just chopped them off. I don't, I have no interest in making it flower. I don't think these flowers look very nice necessarily. And I have also no interest in pollinating it or creating any sort of hybrids. So to me, flowers are just a massive waste of energy. So I just cut them off as soon as I recognize that the new growth is not a leaf, it's a flower instead. So yeah, it's kind of annoying, but that's sometimes why I don't have any growth for like a couple of months in between, not because the plant isn't growing, the plant is actually growing. It's just giving me flowers instead of leaves, but I'll still take it as a positive sign. My, fl my plant would not flower if it's not happy, right? So it's still a sign telling me that, yep, I'm doing everything that I need to do in relation to its growth approach, but I'm just not lucky enough to be rewarded with beautiful, nice leaves that I'm getting stupid little flowers. Anyway, that's really all I've got to say about this plant. I hope that it was valuable and I hope that you can take some of these tips and tricks and incorporate it into your own journey looking after Alocasia cupria. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and leave a nice comment and I'll see you next time. Take care.